to virtual book signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg and we're here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago as usual and we welcome you live with us here in the shop. You are virtually here. That's why we call it virtual book signing. Remember that while we're live you can email in questions and we'll have uh, today's author look right at you and, and answer them. We do have a number of people that have come in today from a beautiful day outside so I'm always amazed in 60s and de in December and people come in because uh, I really have to having to be here right now, rather than 30 below. Uh, as well, if you'd like a book signed or inscribed, we need to tell you that we had a huge run on this book. Uh, Seward is a popular guy, and it's a good book. So uh, we've had a run, and we're now out of first editions. And we do have some second editions that we wrote to get in the last couple of days real quickly. So we do have books for you if you still like them. Uh, as long as they last, I suppose. Uh, but we'll have book plates signed as well, so later on we can have some for you uh, as well. So if you want one, this is your moment. Um, also, remember that we are an antiquarian bookshop. We'll be showing a few artifacts as we go along, and that come out of our stock. We always do that. Those of you who are regular know this. And we show these to elicit a question and uh, imagine that question. So. Uh, if there's something that you like that we show, it could, could be yours as well, because we are looking like a museum in here, but you could walk away with our artifacts, I suppose, for the right price. Right? <laughs> so uh, let's begin, because I have too many questions here not to. Uh, Walter Starr is with us with his Seward, Lincoln's indispensable man. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard Law School and practiced international law for 25 years, including five years with the uh, Security and Exchange Commission. I have no questions on that. <laughs> He's the author of John Jay, Founding Father, uh, and his latest book is the Seward book from Simon & Schuster, 703 pages, illustrated, $32.50, and really the first Seward bio in 45 years, uh, and we needed it. So I'm very happy uh, that we have it. Uh, and stay tuned. I understand that he's going to start working on Stanton. So we could use that as well, and we'll see what he comes up with there. Uh, I usually begin by asking people how you got to this book and why, but the question on everybody's mind, let's face it, is how is Seward portrayed in the movie? And was he his characteristics there, what you expected to have seen? Is he too dapper in that movie? Give us your, your play on it. I liked Seward in the movie. Um, I, you know, sitting there watching it, at certain points I even kind of lost the sense of that this is an actor and felt that this was Seward. Um, I particularly liked um, the perpetual cigar and the way that he kept the cigar even though people around him might be a little annoyed and the frequent, frequently the glass of wine as well. Um, at one point, um, uh, Seward... Um, is at a reception or something with his cigar and glass of wine. This isn't in the movie, but in re real life. Um, and he turns to a reporter and says, you know, I regret to say the president neither smokes nor drinks. Uh, and the president who's standing there says, tells a little story about how, you know, the mere absence of vice is not itself a virtue. But the, the cigar and glass of wine in the movie are great. Um, as is the relationship with Lincoln, the way in which Seward argues with Lincoln, and the way um, in which you know the two of them sort of seem to be comfortable, just at certain moments, just standing in one another's presence. Well, I felt that too. In fact, frankly, uh, I can't think of a an actor in there who didn't do a brilliant job in the way that character was portrayed. Whether it was uh, uh, Tommy Lee Jones with uh, Thaddeus Stevens. I don't think Thaddeus Stevens could have done as good a job <laughs> as Jones did. And uh, Bilbo, of course, by James Spader, almost stole the show, but certainly Lincoln was my Lincoln. And a uh, wonderful movie. So if you haven't seen it, if you haven't heard about it, uh, <laughs> turn on your TV, you'll see an ad. Um, so, back to the book. Uh, how did you get from John Jay to Seward, and, and 
you left the law to to write. Yeah. Um, well, after Jay, I wanted to move to a different time period, and I was pretty sure that it was the Civil War. Um, I was actually, for a while after Jay, full time, very busy with with legal work. But one of the I even when I'm was full time busy with legal work, I always was reading. Uh, and I read uh, Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin, the, the book upon which the movie is based. Um, and, and Seward, I mean, there were other interesting characters in there, but I, I was particularly intrigued by Seward. I think I actually, even before finishing Team of Rivals, went to find that biography you referred to uh, from almost 50 years ago. Van Dusen. Van Dusen. Um, and and looked at that, and then I got really excited because that book is not bad, but boy, I felt I could do better than that. And so by the end of that, um, I was I was definitely interested in doing Seward. You you have many new sources or a number of new sources. Uh, what were they, and what were the most productive for you? Well, the single most productive uh, new source, I'd say, was the Journal of John Austin. Um, uh, Austin was a, a minister in Auburn, New York, a, a personal friend of Seward's. Um, he kept a daily journal, um, and he was with Seward at a number of kind of critical moments of Seward's life. Um, the Freeman trial, uh, he's there as Seward returns from his grand European voyage in 1859, and most important, he's there uh, on the day at the moment that Seward learns that he's not going to be the Republican presidential nominee in May of 1860. Um, and that journal, you know, it existed. Um, I think it had actually been contributed to the Harvard Library uh, shortly before Van Dusen did his book, but it doesn't scream out, this is a journal about Seward. It says it's a journal of a, you know, a universalist minister in Auburn, New York. And, you know, and um, a but friend... you knew his name? And well, a name. friend of a friend. You know, you, you do research partly through, um, you know, libraries, but partly through people. And so when I went to the Auburn house um, in upstate New York, uh, one of the people there, Jennifer Haynes, said, oh, you have to meet the Mokels and talk about John Austin. Well, I'd never heard of John Austin. Um, but through Jennifer, I met uh, Ken and Audrey Mokel, and they had already done quite a bit of work in transcribing Austin's journals and letters. Um, so. Yes, I, I ultimately went to Harvard and read uh, Austin's journals in the original, but, but I knew even before I got to Harvard what I had. I was basically just checking that their transcriptions were right. Mm. Well, you mentioned a point that I wanted to uh, talk about anyway, and that is he was there when, he, when Seward found out he was not going to be uh, the, the president or a nominee for. Uh, how did he take that? And, you know, Amanda Foreman in her book on uh, Great Britain and the U.S. in the Civil War uh, has wonderful opening chapters on Seward fleeing, she says, to uh, London maybe to get away from all of that for a while. Do you subscribe to that? How did he uh, react, the, first of all? Well, well, London comes before May of 1860. London is 1859. He, um, in early 1859, he, he knows that he's likely to be the Republican nominee and several friends suggest that it would be better, rather than staying in the U.S. and perhaps saying or doing something controversial, um, to go abroad. Mm -hmm. And that's very welcome advice for Seward, because he always loves to go places. I mean, he comes here to Chicago um, in the 1840s on the way to Lake Superior. And he, even before that, had traveled to Europe. So he was happy to go to Europe in 1859 and spends actually a long part of that year um, not just in London, but elsewhere. Um, uh, I, I think basically um, her account of Seward in London is pretty good. I think she relied a little too heavily on things that were written after Seward became Secretary of State and thus might have been colored by the tension between Britain and America at that time. Uh, looking at the contemporary stuff, it seems to me he was received um, more charitably than she described. Mm -hmm. All right. So then to shift to your other question about May of 1860, how he takes the news. Um, I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but Austin in his journal says that when, well, step back a bit. Um, 
Austin describes it not as a huge gathering of people, but a pretty small group, smaller than this, um, sitting around in Seward's garden, and um, uh, Seward Austin comes with the telegram reporting the results of the first ballot, uh, on which Seward is well ahead of any other candidate. He's within kind of striking distance uh, of the nomination. I think about 182 votes for the 233 he needs. And as Austin puts it, we had only been talking about 15 minutes when someone came running up with another telegram. And even before getting to, to Seward and his friends, this, this person, uh, Dr. Diamond, screams out, oh God, oh God, it's all gone. Abraham Lincoln has been nominated. Which here in the Lincoln bookstore is perhaps sacrilegious. The walls may fall in on me at any moment, but that's exactly we expected it here. That's exactly what Seward's friends thought. It was all gone that Abraham Lincoln had been nominated. And according both to Diamond and Austin, Seward didn't say anything for a, for a few seconds. And then, according to Austin, he started chatting with his friends about the kind of political aspects of the nomination, almost as if he himself hadn't been involved, as if he was sort of a third party. Um, now, I do think he was disappointed, but what's maybe more remarkable is how quickly he gets over that and starts to support Lincoln publicly, first um, with letters, but then with speeches, and, um, and how he travels the country from one end to the other, uh, campaigning for Lincoln in 1860. Well, sorry, he very certainly long... felt that he was going to be the shogun behind the throne, no? Yes. And uh, so that probably buoyed him up a bit. Yes, I mean he is early, you know, shifting forward after Lincoln is elected, um, and during the secession winter, Senator Seward um, occasionally comments that uh, what, what, to one uh, European diplomat, he says that really, maybe our systems aren't that different. You have a ceremonial king, and you have the leader of the party who effectively runs things. And he thought of himself as being the leader of the party who might effectively run things. Um, and it's only really once he gets into office and begins to work with Lincoln that, that Seward comes to appreciate um, Lincoln. One of the things I appreciate about Lincoln is that after his election, he did not retreat from the issue of the extension of slavery to the, to the rest of the nation. And even though there was huge pressure on him to do that, what do you think Seward would have done with that issue after, yeah. during the time before, as, as states were beginning to secede and he would have, and pressure was on him? What do you think he would have done with that issue? Well, we know that pretty well because Seward was a senator um, and throughout the winter of 1860-61, Seward spends his time pursuing what he hoped would be the Grand Compromise of 1861. And he um, you know, he writes to Lincoln, he, he talks, he gives a lengthy Senate speech in early January. Um, he would have tried to find a compromise, and in particular, um, he was open, maybe not to extending slavery, but to perhaps some form, I mean, here we are in Judge, Judge Douglas territory as well, to, to some form of popular sovereignty approach to the problem in places like New Mexico. And Lincoln himself, in a letter to Seward, uh, says at, during that secession winter that he doesn't care that much about New Mexico as long as it can be hedged about. And Lincoln scholars tend to overlook that. Mm -hmm. But Lincoln himself, at least in that one letter and that one instance, in, indicates that he himself might have been open to compromise, although by the time of the inauguration, he's as you say, very definitely, we're not permitting the extension of slavery.